Hello everyone, my name is David Capra and I'm an artist and educator here at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Welcome to our very special event exchange series where students lead the discussion with artists and curators. We are very lucky to be joined by Newington College and artist Justine Williams here. Um, welcome everyone, good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Well, Justine Williams lives and works in Sydney and is known for making multi-channel videos, often combining one-off performances and installations and often it's ex 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 examining images and the history that is remembered and forgotten, featuring a heady mix of sound, lighting and post-production techniques and owing much to Dada's chaotic energies. Her works draw on an array of sources from subject matter from early 20th century avant-garde art and theatre to her personal experience of dance classes, time spent in her father's wrecking yard and popular culture. For the 20th Biennale of Sydney, Williams presents a radical revisiting of the legendary futurist anti-opera, Victory Over the Sun on Cockatoo Island in collaboration with Sydney Chamber Opera. Victory Over the Sun was first performed in St. Petersburg in December in 1913. The piece is now regarded as central to the Russian avant-garde with sets and costumes designed by Mazimir Malevich where reproductions of these can be seen here at the Museum of Contemporary Art. But we have our first question from Rohan, so if you'd like to start, start with Rohan. Hi Rohan. Hi Jesse. Uh, are there any practices or processes you learned early at art school in photography that are evident in your art making today? Uh, I suppose what would be most evident to me now looking back uh, would be my time spent at University of Western Sydney which unfortunately is closed now, that art school, but it was really quite a uh, radical art school, I think, at the time because you really had, well, not radical, but I just thought it was a great, for me, it was a really great place to make art. And I think some of the I things, the, it's more the processes that I learnt there that have carried through, which is we had quite large um, studio spaces. Um, like all art students, I didn't have a lot of money, and I think what I really learnt there was um, you could just make art out of anything. And they really, what I remember most about that um, time at art school was that art wasn't really delineated between painting and sculpture. Um, mm. It kind of was just, you just made art there. Uh, yeah, of course you had your different disciplines and you had specialist, you know, your um, you know, uh, electives that you took. But I do remember that it was just, you could just make art. And I think that um, that still carried through today where, um, you'll probably see in my work now, I use lots of different um, kind of medias and mediums and um, different modes of working um, to make art. So I suppose that, yeah, and making do, really making do, because if you don't have a lot of money, um, I remember one of my teachers, um, Chai, he always said, make do, it was always about making do, and it, um, my father was a bit like that too. He was one of these um, people that if something broke, you didn't go and buy a new thing, you went, just fixed it, mm. you know? So I suppose it's one of those things that, where the ready-made comes in for me too, is that you just started, I made things from anything. There's no excuse. If you really want to make art and you have an idea for something, you'll find the materials um, to make something. So I suppose that's what really has carried through for me, this idea of um, just, you can make work out of anything and that it's kind of open. Mm. You no, know? I don't know. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. David, what do you think? Can you draw back even further and tell us what you did during your high school certificate? What were you making? Do you, uh, yeah, well, did you study art? Yes, I did. Yes. I don't know if I was so great at it. I think I was a bit scared. I actually mm. did drawing. I did this, did some drawings um, of these kind of groups of young people, like uh, in different, um, I suppose some like rockabillies and these kind okay. of subcultures. Right. And then I also just made a dress, actually, this plastic dress. So I suppose in a way the costume right. is still was, there. That thread and was it, still there. Yeah. And, um, and you touched on family. Were they supportive of you? When I you think were... so. But they just kind of let me do my thing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they weren't like, it's going to be great if you become an artist. <laughs> yeah, but right. I think, you know, yeah. just whatever made me happy, I think. Mm, they mm. let me do it. I, Probably, I wish they were probably a little bit more strict, maybe. You're right. I don't know. But they, yeah. No, I think they were good. 
Okay. Yeah. No, it's good. It's very, um, was it a natural progression for you once you left high school to go into studying art? Was there other things that you considered? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I nearly didn't finish my school certificate. So in year 10, I was starting to get paid dancing jobs and performing jobs right. in theatre restaurants. Okay. Um, and in discos and mm. kind of, uh, yeah, theatre restaurants mainly. So that kind and of sing and dancing kind of thing in front of... Uh, and you used to ho people. host fashion shows at Westfields that's exactly in the 90s. That's exactly you remember that, yes. <laughs> yes. And, and fashion, yeah, that's right. <laughs> In children. What was that like? <laughs> yeah, that was okay. I mean, I, the only trouble was I was always a bit of a fatty, so it wasn't easy for me. <laughs> I was always wearing the older kids' clothes and I was short. Anyway, so I suppose that's where art came in. So, Did you always bring those two worlds together or you kept it quite separate? No, this is my paid work. I am um, working here at Westfields and, and theatre restaurants, but I keep that separate from my real serious art. Or did you always well, mesh them together? what happened was that I hadn't really... That's like I still hadn't finished school, so I was still at school, and then I kind of went through to do year eleven and twelve, and then I was I kind of started to that kind of performing started to leave me, and I just right. kind of just enjoyed being a teenager, I suppose, sure. and, and <clears throat> just trying to get through that. And then I just, as my father said, Justine, you're probably not going to make a great living as a dancer and a singer, so why don't you? just go on and go to university and so I actually went in tried for fashion design I didn't get in oh, there right. and then I went to I tried at art school and I got in there so it was just one of those things Amazing. I just kind of fell into it it wasn't something some people really know I mean I just knew that I was creative and I didn't want to just I knew I wanted to do something else other than just I don't know maybe work in a shop like I have been doing anyway for the past 25 years, but I don't know. Yes, we we'll, might get to that later, yeah. actually. But um, <laughs> Edwin's got a question. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. I've noticed a lot of your surreal sets and modernist costumes, you all use a lot of found objects. Uh, what's the significance of this? Um, just for me, the found objects are part necessity and also I like the idea of, just so that, because it's a, something that already exists and they're, e they're readily accessible, like easy to get, whether you'd be buying them at a $2 shop or they're things that you already own. And I do like to use, or I have for a very long time, like to use objects that um, have had a life, like, because um, my parents were, because of the wrecking yard, my parents are kind of, kind of hoarders in a way, or they kind of collected things which is kind of a result of that depression where people collected things mm. and they didn't want to give things away. I kind of liked objects that had a history, that it had a life to me. And I always, so when I wanted to make these performances or use them in these videos, I kind of felt like I wanted to bring that life or in, make that inanimate object anim, animate it somehow. Um, and also I suppose I'm a product of a time when we went to art school and Marcel Duchamp and the ready-made, it was really, for us, we learned a lot about that. And um, I always liked assisted, for me, I was always drawn to assisted ready-mades, you know, so it was the, um, you know, the table that then had another extra leg or, you know, I always, so for me, I don't know, it was, and maybe too, because I probably was never really great at making things. I mean, that's not probably true, but you know, like for me, <laughs> I just felt like the ready-made made sense to me and it was something that came from the real world and I, 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 people could, and you can adapt it. I like that idea of adapting something that came from the real world. I mean, everything does come from the real world, mm. all objects. Uh, but so changing the purpose of the object or something mm. and placing it within a gallery context to me. Um, transforms yeah, it. Yeah, it transformed it, exactly. And, and I like that idea of transformation. Yeah, you talk about the real world a lot in your work and. Um, and you mentioned that you work in retail. Yes. We won't mention um, your you work at used to work. Do you still work at this very famous shoe store? We were no. just admiring. Every time I see the ad on TV, I think of Justine kind of in the in the background in the, in the shoe store. I always, oh, it's got a fantastic catchy ring uh, ring to it. That 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 particular um, shoe store I'm looking thinking about. Yeah. But we're not at the ABC. You can't say the name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Paul's Warehouse, yeah, everyone. That's right. Um, how has the real world kind of, kind of, in, I guess, entered your work? Like you're talking about the suburbs, growing up in the suburbs in Sydney, um, all these jobs that you, up, you, you had while you were um, 
while you were supporting yourself in an artist as an artist and you still, still I always do. feel like the jobs kind of informed my practice right the jobs what I did at the jobs particularly for me labor and looking is something that's, that's always been there for me mm. and uh, labor in terms of actually doing and making and also and then this mechanized this kind of mechanical human which was very big in early avant-garde um, kind of art but mm. also today sometimes I feel like we're still quite robotic um, and I'm kind of interested in that this where you turn off as a human and kind of just keep going and going and, and there's a compulsion to do that whether it be making art or working um, yeah I suppose I'm going back to that question yeah I don't know if I've answered that. No, correctly. you have. It's yeah. been great. Thank you. And Tom's got a question, I believe. Yeah. Responsibility. I don't know. <laughs> what to make good art? Is it? I don't know. What to or, yeah, what about sorting to achieve? What? Sorry, can you say? Well, I suppose a lot of artists just, whether you're in the Biennale or not, for me, I don't think it matters whether you're in the Biennale or not. It's just the um, same with whether Dave was in the Biennale or not. I don't think it matters. It's just the kind of, we would go, I think you just go ahead making the work as you would anyway. Um, it's just probably that when you're in a more of a high profile exhibition like the Biennale, you're probably aware that more people are looking at the work. Mm. But other than that, I don't think it really, I don't know if there's anything that, um, change or do differently, but I suppose, of course, there's a, you know, a theme which the usually, you know, a Biennale always carries, and I suppose artists' works are chosen because maybe it fits under that umbrella. But um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think do you is think? the responsibility of an artist in general, in and outside of Biennales, and yeah. It's a big question. Um, yeah. I don't know. I suppose everyone has makes art for different reasons. Mm. And art means different things to different mm, artists. It does. Um, but all I know is that you can only be true to, to yourself when you're making the work, whatever that is. Mm. Um, mm. I always think it's a questioning. I think I just keep... The reason why I keep, I suppose for me this is, then comes down to a question about why do you make work or something. Mm. And for me, there's always an eternal questioning or an unknowing and I continue not to know and um, it's always this subtle knowledge that I kind of have but I don't have and I always think I'm a bit of a dumb artist in that I'm not... You know, I'm not super intellectual or anything. I just know that I just have to make this work and I know that it, um, there's a compulsion to do this. Whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. But, um, and I don't know if people get much from it, but I hope that maybe, you know, that people will spend enough time for it, maybe for something to be revealed in the work. Because mm. for me, it's not, I, I don't think it's very, I don't know. Try not to be too didactic. It's I don't know. Yes, keep it quite open. Yeah. It's good. It's, questions are always good starting points. Yeah. Did I yeah. answer that, or do you think, kind of, maybe <laughs> not? Sorry, it's just one of those. <laughs> it's a tricky, do you have yeah, you can, no, you can ask me you another question. I just. Yeah. Mm. In an in, in an artwork. Uh, this is another, I think that's like a similar question. <laughs> They're good, really good questions. Yeah, what is the role of an artist? Oh. Can I you think about the role of you in your last work that you made, the, your opera work? Oh, well, that's an even harder question because... It was many, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. And that's actually another interesting question for artists today because a lot of the time artists today have to collaborate. So you have mm. to have met, wear many hats and be open to many different ideas and work with many different Definitely. people. Um, but I think artists today, I mean, it is opening up. I think visual arts in a lot of ways actually returning to like a previous time like Bauhaus where people would employ 
there'd be lots of people doing different things in the one work. Mm. I mean, there are some people that just make, I don't know. Mm. Sorry, that's, a hard, that's another, I can't, probably can't help you. It's, what do you think, David? I don't well, it's tricky because when you touch on the idea of collaboration and, and often when you think about the way, I mean, the way artists make work and in general, it's a visual form of communication. It's a, it's a non-verbal form of communication. Well, so, that's very, yeah. So how do you kind of, you have to develop external skills when you're working with non-artists in particular like you have to communicate your ideas. And I find that's really tricky sometimes. You have to kind of further, like you've got the idea, it's internal, it's in here, but then you have to kind of go further and find a way to then express it so other people can come on board and negotiate what you're putting out there. And I like what you first said, which is probably more of an answer to your question, which I think is that idea of, as an artist, well, as a visual artist, you develop a language, which is probably non-verbal. Mm. So you develop your own um, language, however that is, and hopefully you will communicate something to the viewer. Um, so they left um, rethinking about, like thinking about something in a different way, or um, just, see, I always never, I don't feel like I've ever got any answers. So for me, and that's what propels me forward, because I'm always, and I try to actually sometimes, actually a part of my work is this circling because it's kind of, I'm always trying to confuse and conflate in the right. same, as well as trying to understand things. So I feel like the minute I understand, I then try to turn it in on itself, whatever it is. I'm, so I'm always going back in on something. It's like I never want to, comp for me, it's, that's why I always like to talk about a circular narrative or a non-linear -li narrative in that I think mm. the minute that you, think you understand something you don't again and it's back in on itself. It reminds me of a workshop you did at Art Space for the Curtain Breathe Deeply a few years back and the very notion of you turning, I think you were turning, you were drawing circles on the wall and it, it was absurd but it was also, it also kind of felt um, like, it, oh, it felt a very well, holistic approach to the... being an artist. We were all lying yeah. down and, and we're, yeah. it was meditative and it was hallucinatory almost. Yeah, that's yeah. the human condition, isn't it? Yeah. So I yeah. feel like we're dealing with the human condition. I know I am. Um, whatever that is. Um, sometimes, I, for me, to a big part as a visual artist is to express something through the body, um, not only my body. And then I hope a lot of the time that when you walk in, you feel something physical. A lot of the so in my installations, I try to make them quite visceral and I try to create this uneasiness so people actually have this physical, um, real sense within their own body. Right, yeah. Um, see, some people can't, when they walk in, they actually feel quite, some people feel a little bit queasy sometimes when they watch some of my videos because it is incessant, it doesn't stop. But that's kind of a part of the intention of the work. Mm. Um, so, and I suppose lately I've been talking about how I kind of want, I kind of choreograph people throughout a space so they move in a particular way throughout these videos and images. Mm. Um, where, and that, that holistic thing where there is no one meaning in a video, but maybe on a whole you get a sense of something. Mm. I'm yep. still not really describing much, am no, I? But that's just... <laughs> that's helpful. Seb's got a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question because that's something that I'm really still trying to work out in my, uh, in my pra practice is that uh, I feel much more at home, I think, in video, making the video uh, and then bringing that back out into space with objects. And because uh, I do feel like that once I've performed and it's, you know, it's been recorded to camera that then I can kind of edit it Mm. and do what I like with the body, double it, uh, control it, control it exactly mm. in post and I really like that. Mm. In a live element which I really want to explore more fully but um, which takes more discipline in a different way I think which I really want to actually start to explore a bit more is the idea of rehearsals which uh, a lot of performance art in the visual arts world, performance art rather than theatre because I've just mm. worked with those theatre guys, it's very different. Mm. They rehearse 
and refine and uh, there's, you just know what you're doing. They use the term dramaturg a lot, which that's, I don't even know what that is still. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So people yes, are telling you world. what to do and where to mm. behave and where to stand. Mm. Whereas in performance art and a lot of my videos, mm. what, what it comes from is this energy, action and emotion which comes from inside and that I can't always describe. You know, um, all I know is that I've made a set, I've made a costume, I've put all these objects together and as I'm building all this in my mind, I'm trying to think of ways and actions and things that I might be able to do for the camera. And so there's never really any rehearsal. It's just I've got to just hopefully I kind of go into this zone and hopefully something will come out at the end after an hour or two of filming and then I chop it up and I edit it. Mm. So, yeah, it's more controlled in the video and I feel much more comfortable in that. But I think with the live work, which I really would like to... Also, another thing with live work in the way I'd like to do it, I think I'd like to see more bodies like I have just done. And that means you need a lot more people and you really have to collaborate again. Mm. And that isn't, isn't easy, I don't think. I think nice. you, well, not for me anyway, not, not that, just because you really have to communicate to everyone at all time. And sometimes the way that I've been working previously in my videos is that I don't need to talk to people. Mm. so much. I just have some friends that I know, mm. you know, like there's a couple of dancers that I know, a kind of, and even the film, the pe film crew that I work with, they kind of know the way I work and they work intuitively. Mm. So I quite, for me, the intuition is a big part of it and it can't be always described and prescribed, is but I really would like to kind of have a mixture of that in a live work. I just know it means I've got to spend more time really working mm. actually and that's where the narrative and the non-linear narrative comes in is that I know for something that I want to do I've got to really write it all down have it a bit more organized before instead of oh let's just still get up <laughs> you know? well that's right that's, that's why I asked about the the idea of communication because it can get in the way it almost kind of can stop ideas from forming have you found in your own self I guess non-verbal forms of communication when you're working with people have you found little niche like things that are working for you or well that's or still well that's actually just working with people I know I find yeah, okay. when I've worked with you and yes get you. so sure. I've worked with David before mm. David we've only really like you've actually performed in one of my works I and have. it was actually that was an extraordinary experience actually. yeah it and, was a magical it was a magical um, day because I arrived um, at this converted milk bar that was kind of a few streets away from your house and it was decked out in, in like a set and there was a camera person there and I remember um, it being, it just, it was just before Christmas, it I was. remember arriving with some bis like Christmas biscuits and, um, and I also remember after we did that segment we were driving down the highway and there was, there was a whole area that had just been backburned and we stepped out of the car and within moments of driving, we within just, moments I was rolling down the hill covered in We didn't in even salt. really plan this. And the camera was there and it captured that moment. And, then, and that was um, one of the best videos actually in the was, whole. It's it allowing so that chance, fun. wasn't it? It's it was, allowing just yeah. to be open. It was quite funny because then I, um, I, because it was Christmas, my aunt and Anna, oh, they don't right. live I very far. Oh, that's right. I should have let you shower at my house and I did it. <laughs> it was and I quite just, funny because oh. my aunt and uncle, they, they were preparing for a uh, for Christmas lunch and I knocked on the door and I said could I have a shower and they thought I had had a breakdown I was covered in soot and they you were had, like, you had a, were no you explain David? that you had a white on which is I actually was, similar to that's what right, you wear that's right my own performance work yeah. but it was um, you're right the idea of collaboration is very um, very interesting it's, yeah. it's always something you're always negotiating but I think yeah and it is one of those things depend, you've got to just got to work with the right people I mm. suppose or mm. well, the people yes. that are more not right but just right for you hey? yeah yep Whereas you kind of, I think you got it, didn't you, David? I, I got it. I enjoyed it, and I, yeah. um, I understood what was happening in that, in, in that work, what you wanted, yeah. what, yeah, what, what your vision was, which yeah. is important. But I'm we've sorry. Got a question from Jack next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've noted a really uh, disjointed nature between the audience, myself, and some of your artworks, mainly because they're not live, but also in works like Crush Dance, which is on the MCA collection. Mm. Um, there are these heavy set TV frames that I feel almost inhibit the immersion. Is that something intentional? Oh, do you think they inhibit the immersion? Ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. No, that's good. You're probably right. Do you mean like in relation to today where a lot of video artists use really big screens? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to do that when I was doing it. But um, at the time, it was just that thing where the... I mean, I love the shape of those old TVs because mm. to me, they're like sculptures. They're boxes. Mm. They're square. And I actually love that square format. You know, this, not always a 16.9. It's a different kind of format, and I quite like that. Um, but it, it references shape. television, doesn't it? That's as right. Well, like the whole history exactly of right. Australian TV, which I'm sure, just by looking at your work, I can. I think Australian TV used to be quite unhinged. Yes. It, like, you know, think of shows Auntie. like Hey Hate Saturday and The Variety. Auntie Jack. Auntie Jack. And we're seeing less of that. And But I feel like in some way a lot of your work is, is paying, playing homage to that. Yeah, I mean, I do love telly, actually. Yeah, I always yeah, like the screen yeah. to be on. I do like the screen. Actually, I like always having moving image, even if you're listening to the radio. Yeah. But, um, yeah, with relation to the TV, I think it was just, it was that thing that when I grew up too, there was, when you'd go into a store, there'd be the big stack of TVs. There are today, oh, but it's yes. a different thing. It's more flat. But in those days, it was um, that pyramid. You know, I just liked that shape they made. And also, too, at the time, they were just being thrown out, and I just, they were... I know that they're really great quality and I just couldn't bear to see all these beautiful big tellies being thrown out and um, you know, they were free and they were on the side of the road. I mean, well, you know, I've still got a, quite a big collection. I should, I don't know quite what to do with them. So, uh, build a house out of them maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David. I'll have to credit you for that idea. Thanks. Um, yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't that I was trying to, um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, it was just those little... And I was actually at the time too, I kind of wanted, the reason why I actually could, I wanted to use all those because it was a good way to actually show a live performance that had been recorded. And then in post when I cut the um, live performance up and then I showed it back into the space on these lots and lots of different screens, I just wanted people to see the same, the thing that you would usually see live, but it's actually kind of broken up and reiterated and transformed through this lens. So it was this, I just, it's the same thing. It's the way that we kind of see images today, or we, the way we view things on our screen, like that um, there's always so many images kind of going on at the same time and what we actually take in. I don't know if that came across, probably didn't come across in the work, but that kind of bombardment of images and, uh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Anyway, I don't know. And Edwin. Uh, yeah. uh, so we were uh, for a while and you spoke to us quite extensively about the uh, black square. Yes. So I was wondering uh, how has its meaning changed and been replaced over the course of the century? Yeah, that's a really good question. I suppose, um, I mean, I mean, I don't know exactly, but I know that, I mean, for some people it would mean the same thing. Other people it would have changed. I suppose today, there's particularly in Stephanie's Biennale, I know she's definitely made reference to the black square now being like a black screen mm. um, with relation to computers and, you know, I suppose the TVs that I'm just talking about. Mm. Um, for me, the black square, when I first came across it again only, I mean, I remember it at art school, but it was just this non-representational black painting. It was great. It was kind of like, wow, okay, so <laughs> there's no, there's no, you know, just the image, there's no image there. It's just empty. Nothing it's black. It's the void. It's beautiful. And mm. it's just zero. Reset. We're all just starting again. It was amazing. And the boldness just to be able to make something black like that and just to stare at it was amazing, yeah? But then for me, it, was, it wasn't until 2013 where um, I was asked with some friends, Alex Goronsky, um, uh, they curated a show about the, the 100 years of the black square. And I started to look at it again and I realised that actually a part of the reason why the black square, square came about was that Malevich was making Victory Over the Sun, making all these sets and these backdrops for, um, they called them back cloths, uh, for Victory Over the Sun. And what he actually started to do was he broke down the picture plane. That's where it really started to happen. So it was this half black and half white um, back cloth. And then, of course, the 1915 exhibition where it first really did become the black square. Um, so I, for me, I like the fact that it kind of originally came from this curtain. Mm. And I'd kind of been looking at curtains or making mm. curtains in my own work. So for me, I really like that, that it came from theatre or somewhere else, um, that the reduction in the picture plane. I mean, of course, he was leading up to that already. It would probably happen to some, or maybe, I don't know. But I also like, too, that um, 
that black square at the time was so, you know, in Russia at the time, people used to put those, the pictures of these, um, you know, saints and um, heads of state in the corner, you know, the, these kind of revered figures mm. up in the, in the corner. And then Malevich, in 1915, in the exhibition, placed it up in the corner. So the black square, this emptiness, this, this kind of pure uh, colour, then was placed up in the corner and placed up high and revered. I thought that was, I really always mm. liked that too, that art was placed up in the corner just art as well, not just this black square. Mm. Um, so I, that's the best thing about the black square is that I suppose today you can see it in so many different ways, as, but also the same way it was back then. Um, it's, I suppose it depends how you want to look at it. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, when I teach at art school, people are still fascinated by monochromes and making, you know, Image, like reductive images too, you know, reducing uh, move the figure kind of and the ground both just kind of so there's there's a nothingness but there's something. So the white canvas has been replaced by a black material or just that black, anyway, I don't know what I'm mm. saying but yeah, Do you want to I think talk? there's so much there in something so simple. Mm, yeah, do you want to talk yeah. about the, the, well the significance of the black square or the the motif that was in your opera as well. Yeah, so in, well that was a difficult one because it wasn't difficult, it was simple but it was difficult in that I had to not only think about the black square in terms, actually no, I kind of just knew that I would ha it would be a cube. Mm, okay. Because it was in space. Mm. It wasn't just going to be, I, I did flattened. want also, yeah, it wasn't going to be flattened so okay. much. And I just knew that there had to be, there was going to be a sun because it was victory over the sun and the sun gets, uh, you know, enveloped, whatever happens to it, whatever you want to, however you want to describe whatever happens to the sun. And I just knew that, I suppose, and the sun for me, I couldn't make a round, so it was kind of practical as well because I knew the sun, I couldn't make a round sun. It was a bit too difficult, so it became a cube, an orange cube. And then so that just had to go in a black box, became a black square, became this cube thing which also just ha is basically you know the four sides mm. I don't know it was so and also I, I, I knew originally too I wanted it to be this thing that was a mirror I wanted to have perspex the black box originally wanted to be this two-way mirror where it's this perspex where you turn the light on and you can see through it and then you turn the light off and it just becomes black and dense and you can't see through it but it was it was very expensive to buy that um, acrylic, you know, that perspex. So it wasn't in the budget. So I, I just bought this very opaque black. And so I kind of liked the idea that also when people sat in the space, I wanted it to kind of be just plonked there in the middle. So it kind of people, so even though I wanted people to be aware that it was an installation space as well as a, a performance space, that it wasn't a, a typical theatre space that was just the black room. It was more... Um, the white cube with a black square in the middle of it or something and um and yeah and so i i, I just wanted it so that the audience had to sit had to look through it and so it was a bit of an impedance but also something you could see through and it was just there in the middle the whole time so um yeah i don't know if that answers your question and jack yeah. you have another question uh, yeah um, i mean i'm sitting in the way that you speak about the black square as a free cell button. Yeah. And I was wondering where do you think art will go in the future and how you'll work if this black square is trying to approach the future? Oh. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> well, I don't know. I know that I'm in the present, you. so I, I, I don't know if it's <laughs> going to go anywhere in the future other than maybe in a garbage bin because <laughs> i got to fit the, the show close soon and I don't think um, I'll be able to store it anywhere. But, uh, <laughs> so I don't think I, I, I can't make any grand um, claims for the work or, but other than, um, yeah, the restart button for me was just that there's a part of, it's just that thing I was kind of talking about where in one way it's, it's really just pressing a button on a camera, on your phone, but then also, um, when there's too much information, you close down and it's an emptying out. But it's also not an emptying out. For me, it's also a closing down. Like if you put so many, if you layer, 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 layer lots and lots and lots of images, all you get is blackness, where there's too much information. So I'm interested too of that thing where there's an emptiness, 
or a void. But then there's also this conflation where there's so much that it becomes black. There's blacked out. So that's just for me. I mean, it's a different thing. So that, um, yeah, I am interested in images and what we look at. So for me, that's there's a part of that that I think of when I just think of the black square, which probably has nothing to do with what Malevich was interested in, in a way. Um, yeah. Um, but the future of art, is that what you asked me? The future of art? Yeah. Um, well, I think art is actually, uh, for, a lot, for a while actually, I used to feel quite um, pessimistic about art. Mm. I used to think, oh, where's it going? But I think lately, more recently, I feel like art actually is becoming more expansive and um, I think more people are becoming more interested. I think through education, I don't know if this is not I true or so. not, yeah. I think more and more, it's not such a weird, not a weird thing, but I don't think, I think more and more people want to come to art galleries, yeah, probably not as many as they used to, but I, I think there's actually a bright future for art and I think the fact that art asks questions and is inclusive and is more open, I think, is its, is its strength. That we don't, we're not, you know, we don't stand steadfast in one thing or only believe in one ideal. Or you know, there's, we allow for, you know, we allow for a lot of things to happen in art. And that's where I think it's, that's um, where it can continue on because we, it's flexible. I don't know. What do you think, Dave? I think art kind of, yeah, like you said, it's appearing to kind of infiltrate more and more into the real world. Yeah. And people are kind of stumbling upon it more and sometimes aren't, I guess, coaxed. They don't know what they're, what they're seeing. They don't have the backlog and the history and the archive of, 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 art, of history. art history. But, but they're, still, they're still re relating to it or they're still in, investing in it in some way. Even uh, if it's just time, their time. Yeah, I think that's really mm. important too. I, I believe too in art that you don't actually have to always have an art. To, you don't have to have an art degree to understand mm. it um, or to get something from it. I think that good art should be able to appeal, or or art that I think should, it should be able to. You should be able to enter it. Doesn't matter mm. where you come from or what you are. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, not that everyone likes all art, but. Am I saying, I don't know what I'm saying, I hope this is all right. It's perfect, <laughs> it's great. Yes, Finn. yeah, just, oh. what, do you, what do you think about the future? Do you yes. have any, yeah. do you have? Well, I like, I like what you're saying towards the end, how it's becoming a lot more accessible. Yeah. And I really like the notion that it's not as weird. Um, and I think that that's... <laughs> well, people's perception of it, isn't it? Mm. Right. Becoming masses of information, but also the, just the anybody can have access to anything. Yeah. That's where I see art. Mm. Yeah, it's good. I think it's a really good platform for people questioning things and ideas, mm. um, and even people coming together. I don't know. Um, yeah. uh, I was just wondering, what about the uh, Compton site shaped your work? Were there any limitations that stopped your work? Yeah, it's a good question, yes. So working out in Cockatoo Island for all artists is always um, really challenging and exciting, I think, because, you know, you, one, you've got to get out and t t across this water. So you can only, you can't just, you know, drop something off whenever you like. So you really had to be quite planned in that way. But the space itself was quite a great space, of course, because it was an electrical workshop. And it had, of course, all those um, spaces there have so much history and it's just there in the, the walls and the floors everywhere. So. Of course, it wasn't a traditional um, theatre space at all, or even an art space, but um, it worked actually quite well. Well, it was hard. In some ways, I was one of those things because my the, I do use a lot of um, found materials or everyday materials. I thought it could maybe it mightn't work against something that already has so much history. I was actually so I thought, oh, do I try and make work? Should I kind of approach the work and make it a little bit more finished so it's so it's kind of sitting a, um, and it opposite to the kind of oily concrete so using these slicker materials in the end I wasn't sure I just kind of sometimes the practical some practicalities actually came out and that was how I actually just ended up making things like I had to um, uh, cover the windows so that it could be dark for the theatre space and 
because of the historical significance, we couldn't touch, you know, you can't touch those windows. So in the end, I just ended up making a whole lot of tarp paintings, which I've done before. And so they just became black square, big tarp paintings, which then kind of just covered the whole space. So I don't, and I was only thing I was, I was worried that that was going to suffocate the space and then that, that wouldn't, the space wouldn't reveal itself. But it, it, it kind of was okay, I think, in the end. It was, the space was strong enough. There was enough of those um, metal posts and stuff for it to still show through, I think. Um, yeah, and I was really aware of how the, that this thing was a performance is three, only three performances that people would see, but then for three months it would be an installation space afterwards. So I was really aware of that had to be something, these objects in there were going to have to last and that they just didn't look, well, I mean, I could have made them just like props, but I just had, I was aware that they had to work in the space afterwards, that they just, uh, that's the reason why I think I made it that theatre in the round or, you know, um, in there. But, um, yeah. I don't know. The hardest thing for me afterwards was once the performance was over was that um, whether I should put the costumes back into the space and how I should present those. Because previously in works I've kind of sewn the costumes up or sticky taped them and made them into a, another painting or a big curtain. Whereas this time then I felt these, these things really was a bit hard to be sewn and it just they were... Um, yeah, I had to actually go back to the retail and just put them on mannequins. Mm -hmm. I had to own that, right. the retail thing. Anyway, sure. yeah, anyway. seb has got a question about yeah. space as well. Yes. Yeah, um, what was the relationship um, between your works and the, often the public spaces that are Other, maybe, not including? Not including, like yeah. Uh, depends, I suppose, the public spaces. When you say public, I'm thinking of, um, I did an outdoor projection, and then I'm at, about to do another one in Adelaide, and, um, and also I've done one previously in Auckland, and they're probably the most obvious ones um, that I think of, in that they've been large projections um, that have just, the public have then just encountered, rather than an art audience. And um, I really quite like that, in that um, someone coming home from work instead of looking up and seeing advertisements or something, maybe you might see this image or something going on that they, what is that? And make them think and stop and maybe have a look at it. I know that um, when I, one particular video that I did show, that was shown in Christchurch, sorry, not Auckland, sorry, Christchurch, um, it was quite good because it was kind of, I believe it was uh, after that kind of, um, when they'd had that whole um, earthquake, and the video showed a lot of industriousness and um, I think people responded to that um, in a positive way because it kind of gave an energy even though it was erratic. So, um, yeah, I don't, um, yeah, I suppose, just depends on the work, I suppose, and the space. And, and when you say public, do you also mean like a museum space in that way? Yeah. 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 Um, well, you can't, you can't control, I mean, you just put it out as an artist, you're always just putting it out there. All you ever do with relation to the space, I know as a woman, I try and create um, big, I try, I try and create vast, messy, kind of labyrinthine spaces for people to try and explore. Um, and I don't uh, want things to be necessarily neat. Um, sometimes it can just be pouring out. I don't know how that people always respond to that but I, I, I like the idea that uh, people, I really like when people have to move through, I try, I, what I do try and do in spaces when I come to them, if it's a large installation, is try and think about how things have been shown in the past maybe and I try to change that up so that um, the viewer that comes in maybe the space, it, it, it seems different to them, the way that you have to enter the space or the experience of it and the work. I don't know if that's really important or not, but that's just something I do try and do. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered. Any other questions? Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Is that all right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Do you look at other things other than art when it when you talk about negotiating space? Do you look at do you look at all sorts of things like um, theme park rides or 
Oh, yeah. That's is there other things? That for me, to... it used to be the shopping centre. The shopping centre, yes, which is... Was a really big thing for me for a long right. time in my okay. work and how that... Uh, they used to make you walk all the way along one way mm. just to go down escalators. So it's always the long walk mm. to get to something. Um, it's made to get you lost. Yes. Mm. And even just the way that uh, shops would present um, things, this presentation mm. desire, mm. Um, mm. attracting, repulsing, all that kind of thing. I was interested in those ideas that are presented to you every day in these very um, plastic, I always think these such controlled plastic environments. Mm. Um, Whereas I suppose mine's more like the inside of my head or something being spilled out, which is not always <laughs> the best, but yeah. But uh, yeah, that would probably be, um, and also moods. I know that sounds really, colours and moods. I do try and okay. create colours and, I know that sounds a bit funny, but that's just. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with colour, shape, the yeah, circle. Yeah, that's right. The, yep. the mood, holes, circles, yep. um, veils looking through, um, um, moving, you know, moving these kind of liminal spaces. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if that okay. answers well, honey, much of that for question? you. Oh. Yeah. What kind of work do you make? Sorry. What do you do? You, what kind of work are you making at the moment? I like um, sculpture. I do like your idea of moving through the art and engaging. Mm. Yes. Well, that was the thing. I think because I did come from photography and it took me a long time, like, you know, my photographs are always on the wall and I think there was a, that's a part of it, I think, yeah. too, was this desire to make performance what I used to do but, and I never had enough guts or whatever to do it. And then this image, which I still love to make the image, but it's a different way of viewing and experiencing an image and the visual, yeah, whether it be on the floor or a more tactile thing. Yeah, so you make sculpture, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you buy yours or find yours? Yeah. Fantastic. Council cleanup. <laughs> and do you find, isn't that extraordinary how some people, for me, mm. actually the, um, the aesthetic and the formal brilliance that you sometimes can come across yeah. of the toaster placed next to this little table next to something, you just couldn't make that myself. I mean, but it's not in the gallery. But no, but you know, it's quite beautiful, isn't it? Sometimes, you know. And then some people just dump it all. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Be careful, maybe handle. No. <laughs> but it's true. That's great. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, cool. Justine, you just said that you weren't. You were working with photography because you weren't brave enough to work in performance. What made you brave? Brave well, enough. What What was the well, other people, like, well, there was lots of people in Sydney I starting to this. already make, um, and my ex-partner, he used to make a performance. And then we travelled to the States, yep. and um, he taught at a um, performance arts, like a sc art school that, where there was, yeah, in Boston, yeah. where there was mm. a lot of performance. There was quite different to what I'd experienced right. previously, and it was really quite pared down. Mm -hmm. And I just went, oh my gosh, what am I worried about? <laughs> Why don't I just release the freak from within man and yes. just do what I want to do. And how did that feel the first time? Were you <laughs> Scary terrified? but amazing. Right. And the stump, you know, and I reckon the juice. Don't you reckon that sometimes yeah. there are things in art and you, it doesn't matter what it is in life, can be art, can be whatever, a project can be anything. If you feel that, sometimes it's a bit scary, but you're like, oh my God, this is good, or this is a bit weird, I know this is, I'm moving somewhere, you must feel that too, David. Definitely. And then you just gotta go with it, you never know where it's gonna take you, and I think that's a part of that rush, it's just so cool, isn't it? It is cool. It's, or maybe it's, it's not a rush, but you know, that kind of, oh, I don't it's know. It's something. Yes. Yeah, it's something. Rohan? Yeah, hi, um, I've noticed that this is the first time we worked in live performance with so many other Mm. Uh, how did you find this transition from your traditional work? Oh, very difficult. Very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Um, uh, some parts were great, really good, uh, but some bits were not so easy. And I suppose it was just that um, thing that it was such a short amount of time that I had to, it was two and a half months that the whole thing was made. And so um, it was just, I mean, that's when you actually have to have work with so many people because you just have to, you know you want to get something done, you have, so you have to outsource. So you're working with lots of different people, but it was that thing where, so you're trying to make this over here and think about this over here and work with these people. And so an interpersonal, I found sometimes the interpersonal um, a little bit difficult, um, 
particularly too when some people come from a different um, discipline and have different ways of working. Um, and I have talked about this recently where um, as a visual artist, maybe I'm a little bit loose and I'm probably um, may seem like I'm disorganised, but I do have a plan and I know what I'm doing. But it's a different way of working to maybe like the opera guys, which were fantastic, they were great, so skilled, but very um, methodical in a different way. And so it was really had to, um, yeah, meet halfway. And so the collaboration, all those kind of collaborations then become slightly, comp become a compromise as well, but that's okay. Because otherwise it would, you, you, you know, if it just was only the way I wanted, only the way they wanted, it probably wouldn't have been so interesting. Um, but that's that was another thing is that they call it a radical revisiting of the victory. Mm, but I don't think it actually is at all. I think it was quite considering we're in the twenty first century. I think it was quite conservative in lots Do of ways. You? Yeah. In how, how so? Because um, it was just costumes <laughs> that would just look that just looked a bit like a David Bowie kind of thing or a bit Madonna-esque or a bit something that already existed now. And the music, um, probably the music was still quite traditional but there was a little bit of moving forward but it wasn't really. If I think we had to work with the Zaum, which is what was really a big part of that libretto, which is that nonsensical mm, um, mm. Speech that a lot of people used. There wasn't that actually was reduced, and I think if we had to use that, in, we had to compare what they did then in 1913 to what we did today. Should have really got rappers in. Rappers. Okay. Start a rap, you know, like <laughs> you know that kind of thing. With that because that's yeah. the similar thing, really. Do you know what I mean? I think the politics ways, of what you were doing was interesting. Yeah, the though. politics, like the bot gender. Yeah. Restaging what was what was quite a political act to begin with all the way back then, and then yes. placing it. I think just the very notion of restaging it is quite a political I act. suppose so too and I, I suppose also too and, and when Pierce wrote that fabulous, rewrote the libretto mm. in such a great way um, he did really address things about gender which is right. you know which the futurists were such male chauvinists so there were lots of things you know and even like body there were, you could see there was lots of things he'd written in there that probably applied to today that mm. was um, brought it forward um, but yeah Anyway, sorry, I don't know. I just went off on a tangent then, didn't I? I'm really helpful. sorry. <laughs> did, did, um, could we talk a little bit about dance, maybe? Yes, I know sure, that, definitely. Um, I mean, I've seen some fantastic photographs of you and your sister in your Bass Hill dance a step for days back in the, the 90s. Um, and you work with Emma Sorkin. They were actually Sorkin. the 80s. Well, the 80s, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was the 90s. <laughs> um, which, they're, they're fantastic. Yeah. Do, do you draw upon that history? And, oh. as, I love dance. I'm such a frustrated mm. dancer. Mm. I just, yeah, look, I actually feel, I feel like I should actually go back and almost, I just I love movement. I love mm. moving with the body. Yeah. I, I just think even though I'm not a very good dancer anymore, or not enough I ever was, but, um, you know, I, oh, I just, there's... So what was it like being, growing up in those dancer Stetford days back in the 80s? And uh, yeah, I mean, it was really good, but it was, I mean, you know, I had quite a strict to teach, but that's not really important, yeah. I suppose. It's just mm. one of those things. Um, if I know, that's one thing I do like about art too, is that I can now, if I want to dance in art, I can. You can, yes. And it doesn't right. matter that I'm not tall and I'm not this and I'm not that, and the body's not perfect. Mm. Sometimes that's better, it's more interesting that you look at a body in a different way. That's right. An older yeah. body, a, a different body, or, and one that maybe doesn't work as good as it should. And I think that's interesting. And then, then you place it within an art context and then you place some visual, like, um, some ideas about, particularly for me, for painting in the body. Right. And then layer that. And I layer all these different histories for me or ideas that I have within visual art and the body that I see within painting because I'm a frustrated painter. I just think it's, it's great. Mm. Mm. You know, really bring them all together. And you worked with um, dance practitioner Emma Saunders and you seem to both have a, uh, a very... Uh, I think a shared vision of dance. It's quite exciting to see you both work together. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be doing something together in June. So oh, that's the, yes. Okay. And she helped me on the Victory of the Sun, which yes, was really good. Yeah. She just broke everything down. I she could was fantastic. See her, I could see her movement in, in the work. As, yes. Yeah. She really was made things very clean. When I was trying to busy things up, she right. made things really clean, which okay. was really nice. So it'll be interesting to see what we do in June. And what was that? 
you know, when we're talking about nonverbal communication, yeah. I think Emma is kind of an, a great nonverbal communicator too. She does use her body and did, was it easier to kind of um, work together because she understood that it's more like you know, it's this and that and it's not this? And, well, the funny thing was yeah. she really only came for two days and right. she, or a day or two, I can't remember. Yeah. And I just said to her, look, I'm making this dance called the Jackhammer dance in there and it's just too busy and I can't sure. communicate to the dancers. And I said, I know I want this. <laughs> and I want this Catholic. Yes, right, um, sure. The sign Jackson, of the cross, yeah. you know, because yeah. I love the ritual in that. And I said, I know I want lying down and I, I know I want this and I've already got this, this dog right. shaking the leg. Yeah. And I said, I know I want hunting and I know I want this right. and I know I want that. And then she was like, okay. And so she, I, sh I showed her what we'd already done. She was like, yeah. right, okay. And then she yeah. just broke it down. It was great. She kind of brought it down to an essence, which I think is really, so it's cleaner. But then, yeah, mm. I think we, yeah, anyway. Great. Yes. And Finn, I've got a question. Finn. Yeah, I was just wondering if there are any ideas that came out of working Yeah, great question, yes. Um, always when you work on things, it's always, I, I can't wait to make some new work. I've already, uh, I've already had a plan to make a this silent film with an orchestra and a foley artist for something next year um, as a part of this fellowship for the Australia Council and that's what I proposed that. And um, that was based on this um, early surrealist, uh, first female surrealist film. Um, and now after doing that opera, which was live, there's a part of me that would like to kind of break it up, that film, somehow think about presenting it in a much more, I don't know, 3D kind of experience for the audience. I'm not, ex but yes, there are, and there are ideas, I suppose, within the opera. Um, um, I can't even think of some now, but it just, just working with more people, that, like even working with opera singers again, whether I do that or different. Yeah, there's just so many. I can't even describe. There's just at the moment I'm kind of I, I, I'm making some new. There's a live thing. I like. To, there's a lot of things I'd like to do, of course, but I can't describe. Do you, do you um do you ever see yourself restaging that opera in a different setting? Well, I setting? think it might. I think it might happen. Maybe. Mm. I think it might mm. happen. Yeah. I think some people uh, would like to see it happen again, so it probably will. Um, uh, you know, there was, after it finished, I thought, oh, if I ever did it again, I'd change this and that. But now it's like, oh man, if I ever did it again, just leave it as a cross. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just leave it as it is and then just move on. See, that's where the new ideas for a new work, that's when you use those in a new work. And, anyway. And um, I was going oh, to sorry. ask, um, have you ever thought of television or um, other forms of technology like film or television or going into those kind of areas? Yes. Uh, oh, I always wanted to, well, <laughs> yes, I did want to be in television. <laughs> you did. I thought you'd be great on television. Kids television is Kids TV. Cheese TV. Yeah, <laughs> cheese TV. Okay. Anyway, but yeah, no, I just, um, I'm happy in yeah. the, um, mm. making things in art. But of course, if people, you know, wherever opportunities, people mm. that you meet, depends on the people, I think. Mm, mm. I always think for me now, really more and more, the people that I meet and the people I work with are really important. Yeah. You know, and that um, that will decide, I think, from now on, as I'm getting a bit older, what what you choose to do and what you don't. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the time, I don't get a lot of money. But you know, mm -hmm. you spend a lot of money, but you don't make much at all. And I just think it's got to be a good experience for me. Um, and I like things to feel good. Like I want to have a good feeling <laughs> about things. Um, so that's really important for me. Um, Anyway. Yeah. We've got time for one more question, don't we? Does anyone? Yeah, does anyone got anything else? What are you guys up to? Let's talk about you. I'm sick of. Wasn't someone here sit in the chair and I'll ask you a question? <laughs> what, are we, what, are you, what are you making at the moment? Oh, Rahan. Um, it's Rahan, um, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, not much at school we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> at school, <laughs> Your teacher doesn't want to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at school, Oh, fantastic. Mm. She's great. Yeah, we made some, uh, well, we all combined, a combined effort, chose a shape, and used those shapes, um, used them on a massive canvas. Mm. Uh, wow. And it was an interesting experience working with like other people, which most of us hadn't done. Just, like, it is interesting, isn't it? Like, um, 
your life work. Yeah, it was an interesting experience, like sharing the space, coordinating with each other to produce the like, end result. Yeah. It's a really good experience. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really good. I mean, it sounds like you've got some great teachers there, which is really good. And so what um, are you... Do you, I always think to another thing with your art today is that if you have other skills, bring them into the work mm. as well. Don't, you know, it's not that it doesn't I just, agree. you know, it doesn't just have to be the painting or the sculpture. You can bring, if you can, I don't know, tippy toe on your feet or play the violin with your little fingers. I don't know, there's all things you can bring into the work. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Sorry, I, no, do, I do have a bit of a head cold, so I think maybe the cotrals <laughs> um, not working, but yes. Um, and can you tell us all about um, how you're all dressed today? You're wearing black. Yes, and fabulous. Mm. You're in mourning. Jack, yeah. Black was meant to be an allusion to Malievich's black square, and um, we were hoping that the clothing would come off as almost gender neutral, which is something that came up a lot mm. in it's very the true. restaging of your work. Not necessarily gender neutral, but no, that's. Actually, that's one thing I think that is quite, um, that comes up a bit in my work uh, is these kind of stereotypes actually of gender that I think um, for me that uh, particularly living in the suburbs, I'm interested in stereotypes of male and female and um, gender and how they actually, sometimes I feel like gender can be performed. And, um, and today, and how do we present ourselves and it doesn't matter, I don't know, and how sexuality or gender can be fluid, maybe? Mm. And I mean, it's even more present now, you know, with people really, um, you know, considering themselves trans and stuff like that. But for me, it originally just came from coming from the suburbs and men that, <laughs> you know, drove the utes. And women were in the kitchen, kind of. I mean, not mm. that bad, but you know, mm. I, for me, I found that quite fascinating. Yeah, that it's, it and, but also too, this thing that the suburbs were really meant to be these places where I came from the suburbs uh, with, it's actually kind of the strangest things happen in the most ordinary places. And, um, and you know, you, come, you live in the suburbs too. I do, and yeah. I find sometimes, I like eking out those, those unusual magical places mm. in the most mundane. Mm. And that's maybe where also the um, using ordinary materials or the found object it's transforming that um, into something else. So transformation, I think, has always been something that I've been fascinated with um, in the work. Um, and I think that's really interesting about that agenda. Um, but it had to be in that work, definitely in that, that opera, had to be addressed <laughs> that there were strong men. So, um, yeah, actually, originally I did want the gym that I was going to, there's a lady there and she was always, I think she was great, she was always so strong and she used to be funny and, walk around with the dumb, come on ladies. And I thought, oh, she would be great. I actually wanted real gym ladies just to be there. And I wanted them to actually perform. But you know, of course it became the opera women, which were, be they were beautiful, gorgeous looking women anyway. But it just, um, that's where kind of some of the original ideas came from. But um, yes, no, thank you. That looks great guys, really good. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you Newington and thank you Justine. We've had a wonderful chat. So uh, good afternoon to you all. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> Do you want something else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Say, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, oh, I thought we were. It's like TV. Thank you for yeah. the today. Pleasure. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. I've learnt so much from you guys asking me these questions. I'm gonna have to make me think. I think <laughs> it's very good. Sometimes we just good. go about. Sometimes you just go about making, making, making. But it's good um, for you guys to ask me these these questions. And sometimes too, uh, I find in. Um, Especially if you don't go to openings or, or I don't see as many of my friends anymore, sometimes the dialogue, you get asked similar questions, whereas I think you guys have asked questions that maybe you wouldn't get raised, mm. and I think that's really mm. important um, for me to think again in a different way, or, oh yeah, I really should think about that, or opening ideas about my practice, anyway. Mm. So good luck with everything, thank yeah, you. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>